Nicolet. Hello. 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 Taylor, you'll have to correct that if I uh, did it wrong. And Nikolai, I couldn't recall the spelling off the top of my head, so. Um... But let's just let's just say that you're lucky that <clears throat> I can even enunciate your first name halfway correctly. <laughs> no problem. I, I usually just copy paste it from the previous meeting. Oh, yeah, good. Hey, there it is. Maybe the other way of thinking of it is that I should consider that I'm lucky that I can uh, halfway enunciate it correctly. So I don't, uh, I don't get punched through the Zoom. Nice. That's, uh, yeah. <laughs> uh, good deal. Well, hey, folks, we are a couple of minutes in. I'm going to put a link to the meeting minutes in the chat. These, these are community meeting minutes, and it's a community call. Uh, it is a CNCF call, so we do record the meeting and, and post it to YouTube. Uh, but uh, the participation in the meeting and participation in the meeting minutes open to everyone. <clears throat> um, you don't need to be a member of the CNCF or be representing a particular project to have an active voice and uh, bring up topics and things like that. So. Uh, so please don't be shy, and if your name isn't in the meeting minutes, please um, drop it in. Couple, uh, we'll probably lollygag for another minute or two, um, uh, but it, now is a good time to make a call for agenda, call for topics. So if you have any of those, please toss them in at the bottom of the topics list. And I think that we will get to them today. We should have enough time. My hope is, is that um, uh, Florin Chorus would be joining us today. So, I, Florin, are you on by chance? Yep, I, I am. Oh, very good. Good deal. Nice to meet you, Florin. Pleased to meet you too. Uh, you're. Uh, do, I don't, you, you know, I ho hopefully there's some flattery involved in uh, your topic and your kind of your area of focus being of such interest that uh, we're asking for an encore uh, from your Envoy Con. Yes, there is. Thank you very much. <laughs> Good deal. <laughs> Good deal. Yeah, you were the, that was, if we go back into the meeting minutes, that was kind of a subject of discussion. We, uh, we sort of meandered um, last time that we spoke, but um, uh, but that ends up being a good thing uh, because then we we stumble into topics like the one that you're focused on. So given that it is five after and we've got some uh, a small collection of folks, it's it's probably it's probably time to get going. Um, Taylor, I'm gonna toss on maybe another like we've got maybe a couple of other topics. I don't I don't know if how much. 
either time or how much desire we have to try to dig into them um, here, but this is a, a very appropriate venue for some discussions around work that, that you guys have been stewarding. So. Yeah, I was actually about to add it, so. Oh, nice, okay. So uh, with no further, if Florin, with no further ado, if, if you don't mind just uh, giving a brief introduction and, and uh, taking it away with telling us about Envoy and VPP. Let me see if I manage to share my screen. Um, our, can you see my slides or do you see my? Your slides, nice and okay. pink. Perfect. So then that means it, it, it works properly. So uh, I guess, hi everyone. My name is Florian Koras. I'm a Cisco Technical Lead, also a FIDO VPP project maintainer. And the point with today's talk is that would be to give you a high level overview of the benefits of using VPP as Envoy's network stack. Now, my background is in networking. In particular, I'm one of the co-creators of VPP's host stack. So I typically talk about transfer protocols and socket layer implementations. However, today I'll mainly focus on how Envoy can leverage user space networking and some of the benefits uh, thereof. Now, before we dive in, and in the interest of those of you who are not familiar uh, with VPP, which I hope not to be that many, uh, a very, very brief, quick introduction. VPP is an LT2L7 networking stack, which at its core leverages two important ideas, vectorized packet processing and the modeling of the forwarding as a directed graph of nodes. Now, when these are done correctly, they ensure really efficient use of a CPU's caching hierarchy and consequently a minimal overhead per packet when doing software uh, forwarding. Now, another really important aspect of this approach is composability. That is, starting from the simple ideas, one can implement all types of network, let's call them functions, from device drivers to L4 features, and then tie them together to build a really efficient full network processing uh, pipeline. Looking at this from a less abstract standpoint, it might be worth noting that VBP is typically used together with VPDK, so it supports a large set of network interfaces. Although should be noted that it also has a smaller set of really efficient native drivers. It supports L2 switching, bridging, IP forwarding, virtual routing and forwarding or VRFs. So it has the right constructs for L2 and IP layer multi-tenancy. But in addition to these uh, basic L2 and L3 functions, it also supports a multitude of additional features. And just to name a few, a very efficient IPsec implementation, ACL, NAT, MPLS, segment routing, various flavors of tunneling protocols. So things like VXLAN and LISP, for instance. On top of the networking stack, VPP also implements a custom host stack built and optimized in a very similar fashion. As one might expect, this supports the commonly used transports, things like TCP and UDP, but also TLS and QUIC. Um, it has a session layer or a socket layer. Now this one provides a number of features, but perhaps the most important for the context uh, of this talk is the shared memory infrastructure that can be used to exchange IO and control events with external applications using per worker message queues, or what's depicted here as MQs. Finally, to simplify interoperability with applications, VBP uh, provides a communications library, or VCL, which exposes a POSIX-like APIs northbound towards uh, the applications. So, I guess that by this point, some of you may be asking uh, the inescapable question, or maybe not, um, why yet another host stack? Um, and you'd be right to do so, because from a functional uh, perspective, Linux is obviously the one stack uh, to use. However, 
because Linux's networking stack was designed around the single pass run to completion model per packet performance is limited. And this is especially noticeable when hardware acceleration cannot be leveraged. But in addition to the speed that could be provided by a faster transport or a faster socket layer, the fact that the stack is in user space could be leveraged to optimize integration and perhaps uh, even minimize the amount of data copies that happen between uh, the application and, and the stack. Also, because the whole protocol stack is packaged with the application, it could potentially be customized or extended in certain situations. One can certainly imagine scenarios where, uh, for instance, the socket provides more context data to, um, to the underlying layers with the aim of improving uh, network utilization by the applications. Um, also know that this does not preclude Kubernetes integration. In fact, VVP can be used as a data plane by CNIs like Calico. So how exactly does Envoy integrate with VCL and what sort of changes were needed in case anybody's interested? And by the way, I forgot to mention this at the beginning, stop me if you have any questions or um, feel free to tell me to skip over the details if this is not interesting. So coming back to this, um, rather intuitively, let's say the first step was to make sure that Envoy components do not make any assumptions with respect to the underlying socket layer. And consequently, they always use uh, generic socket interfaces such that they can potentially interoperate with custom socket layer implementations once they're available, because initially none beyond the Linux or Windows, depends, or Mac OS, depending on how it was built, was being used. So obviously this was not exactly glamorous work. Most of the changes uh, were not features. They were more focused on refactoring. Still out of the set of changes that have gone in perhaps the most notable are the fact that as a community we decided as a core rule we now must avoid using raw file descriptors anywhere in the code. Uh, IO handles are still exposing the FDs um, but last time I checked I think we've managed to to clean them to a point where they were only used in a couple of places. Um, we've added support for pluggable IO handle factories, or in other words, support for multiple types of sockets then uh, can be used uh, at the same time in the same instance of, of Envoy. An interesting consequence of the first point is the fact that uh, file event creation is now delegated to the IO handle implementations. So a desired side effect of this is that the socket layer that provides IO handles is the one that decides how the events for this IO handles are created. In other words, we now socket events are, are no longer tightly coupled with lib event. Some coupling still needs to exist and I'll go over that in a second, but now that one is not implicit anymore. And finally, perhaps an interesting scenario that might serve as an example uh, for the community going forward was TLS, which mainly for convenience reasons relied on BIOS that needed explicit access to the file descriptor. Um, but it eventually turned out that uh, writing a custom BIO that uses um, the IO handle as opposed to the file descriptor is relatively straightforward. So we, we actually switched to that. So I guess this reinforces the first point. Uh, as much as possible, although it's going to be a longer path, people should try to uh, use everything, uh, all, all the means necessary to avoid using the, the raw file descriptor. Now, these changes are enough to allow the implementation of a VCL specific fix socket interface, but they still leave one or uh, one more problem to be solved as I alluded to before. Namely, both libevent and VCL want to handle the async polling and the dispatching of the IO handles, but only one of them can be the main dispatcher. Now, 
the solution to this problem is to leave control to a lib event and to register the event of the associated to a VCL workers message queue with lib event. Now, if you recall, since I'm relying now on you remembering my previous slides, the message queues are used by VPP to convey IO uh, and control events to the application. The event FD now is used to signal the message queues or the MQs transition from empty to non-empty state, just that. So this ultimately means that uh, VPP generated events will force lib event to hand over control to the VCL interface, which for each Envoy worker uses its own locally maintained EPOL loop or EPOL file descriptor to pull afterwards the events from VCL and subsequently uh, dispatch them. Now, these are just the stepping stones for the Envoy VCL integration and um, as first next steps, the plan is to further optimize the performance. Now, the lowest hanging fruit there are the read operations. Um, as VCL could pass pointers to socket data in the shape of buffer fragments instead of doing a full map copy. The groundwork for this is already done. In fact, since I've done this the first time, I, uh, I've gotten it to, uh, to actually work. But what's left is uh, uh, the actual, let's say, integration. It's not enough if um, VCL avoids the mem copy once, if Envoy gets the data in, in its filters and proceeds to copy it several times afterwards, will obviously lead to uh, inefficient uh, usage. So there's still some work to be done that. But speaking about performance, to evaluate the potential benefits of this integration, I used the following topology, wherein WRK connects through uh, VCL and Envoy, which performs HTTP routing to a backend Nginx. Now, this type of scenario might not be relevant in practice. And in, in fact, I'd be delighted to learn from you or any, uh, anybody else who uh, is using Envoy in practice or deploying Envoy in practice what would be interesting. Nonetheless, for the purpose of this experiment, this is ideal because on the one hand, it gives us an idea of how many VP workers are needed to load Envoy. And on the other, it gives us an upper bound on performance. So at a glance, these results show us that for an equal number of cores consumed, one VPP worker is actually enough to outperform the kernel by a significant margin. Uh, performance is seems to be very good, 20 to 40, <clears throat> 20 to 40% better, and to scale pretty well. The star in the margin there is that after a certain point, about four to five workers, performance does not scale linearly anymore, and it behaves somewhat worse for larger payloads, albeit should be noted here that for this test in particular, uh, TSO for VPP was not enabled. So backing up or uh, as a summary, results are really encouraging from, from our perspective, but there are still some things that need further investigation for, for a better understanding. So we're clearly faster than the kernel, but we need to understand if the scaling of the performance has to do with my test bed, has to do with VPP, VPP, VCL, uh, VPP, uh, sorry, uh, Envoy integration, or maybe the, the problem could lie in, in Envoy. So we, we, uh, we might need to, um, to further optimize some code there. With that, uh, should you be interested in further exploring the Soundboy VBP integration, please give the code a try. You, you have a, a link now there to, to my GitHub. It's a bit stale, maybe a, a month old. Uh, I still need to uh, upload the zero copy um, version of the code. And um, in case I won't be able to answer all of your questions here, feel free to email me or grab me on, on Envoy Slack. With that, thank you very much. 
and do let me know if you have any questions. Nice, very good. Um, well, um, before I ask a couple, um, Florin, thank you. And uh, it's an open floor for, for others who might, might have questions or comments or, or feedback for Florin. I, I have a couple on my side, if I can. Sure thing. Yeah, okay. <clears throat> Uh, so, uh, uh, Florin, can, can you please get back a little bit in the slides? Yep. Uh, let me know Maybe... what slide I should stop. Okay, let's uh, let's stop at this one. Oh, no. Okay. The next. Uh, okay, okay, so 11. Uh, the performance, yes. Okay. So, um, this is this is good, of course, and uh, again, uh, as as Lee already said, thanks thanks for the presentation. And for sure, this is an interesting work. So, uh, one of the things that probably this group would, would be interested in is how this thing. I don't know if you have played with it or do you have any thoughts around this. How this thing can be used uh, in um, in like in the cloud native, let's say, landscape. Like, uh, if I want to deploy this within Kubernetes and use Envoy as a sidecar, which you know mm -hmm. uh, somehow depicted here, if you if you if you will. Yep. Uh, I mean, uh, is there any out of the box, uh, I don't know, solution, any ideas? Do I need to use any, I don't know, customized Kubernetes or whatever? I don't know what you can say about it. Right. So let's, let's, uh, let's look at several things here. First of all, um, could you use VPP within um, uh, with Kubernetes? And the answer would be yes. And as I mentioned, and in case you, I'll, I'll pass over the slides, there's even a talk now happening at, at KubeCon mm -hmm. with respect to the Calico VPP integration. So yeah. uh, Calico can use VPP as a data plane. Um, coming back here, right, so what sort of, uh, integration should we expect or what sort of integration would be possible for um, for Envoy with Calico VPP and then subsequently with, with the applications. And now there's several modes of operation. Yes, you could deploy Envoy uh, as a sidecar and then have that attached to VPP and you can have several instances of those Envoys. So not only one. The question afterwards is how do you connect the applications to your Envoy? And what I'm depicting here is the general case, which probably is the safest uh, case as well. And maybe we should uh, dive into that a bit. Remember here, the integration is shared memory. So what, what's happening here right now is shared memory. It, it will not offer you the same sort of security that uh, the kernel offers you today. So uh, what I'm depicting is Nginx talking through a tap interface to an Envoy. So this fits precisely the model of deploying Envoy as a sidecar together with uh, your application in a container and then VBP acts as a, let's call it the container switch slash router. It's, a C, it's part of the CNI um, or programmed by the CNI. Um, Another mode of integration would be to, to have only one Envoy per node, let's say, instead of uh, adding one Envoy for each container. Um, now, it's well known that Envoy does not support namespacing at this point, and there, there, there have been efforts from others uh, in this direction. There have not been upstream. So, if if we want to do something like that, probably we will need to 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 change Envoy. And finally, the most efficient way of doing this uh, within Kubernetes would be to not leverage tap interfaces, but actually leverage something that we call cut through sessions. And let me explain. So. If two applications attach via VCL to a VBP instance, 
where that VPP instance, what it offers uh, is the socket layer functionality, the host stack functionality. But if both of those applications attach to the same VPP instance, that socket functionality is actually not required. The kernel is known to be inefficient in that you, uh, whenever two applications attach to it, say using uh, TCP, uh, the kernel will actually go through the TCP layer implementation. So it does a, a, a lot of extra work that it, it should not uh, do. Well, with VPP, we support what we call cut-throughs, meaning VPP detects that both Envoy and the application are attached to the same VPP instance, and it uses pure shared memory uh, buffers to, to exchange uh, data. This go now this comes with a caveat, as I mentioned before, this is shared memory. So one, we haven't put that much effort into securing, properly securing this. And that was a very long uh, answer. I hope it clarified at least some of your, your points. Okay. okay. The, did, did I capture what you were interested in or were you aiming for something more specific? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I guess that, that there's a lot that can be di discussed here. Probably we're just like opening the, the discussion maybe offline. Uh, mm -hmm. So, I, well, okay, my second question, and that will be the, the last, because uh, I saw that Taylor already added the a CNF uh, initiative that they started. Um, one of the things that, that actually <clears throat> uh, folks and other groups are trying to actually uh, bring uh, into the cloud native world uh, is are these um, uh, CNFs or cloud native networking functions. And if we, if we see this envoy as a networking function, um, I don't know if you have thought about it. I understand that it's a kind of an experimental, but a question and maybe an advice. Uh, would this be possible to actually actively figure out if there is VPP available or not, so that you can actually deploy it in a public cloud infrastructure, the same, let's say, a container envoy, and then if there's no VPP, it will just do whatever, um, like use the standard kernel interfaces, or is it is it so heavily modified that it can only function with VPP or how is this? Uh... Hmm. Uh, let me see if I understood the question correctly. So you're wondering if if from, uh, from the application or maybe from- No, 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 I'm, I'm sorry. From Envoy point of view, assuming that, that I want to deploy only Envoy in a mm -hmm. container. Uh, not as a sidecar, not as anything. I consider that Envoy is my function that I want to deploy, my, mm -hmm. my ap application. Uh, the version that you have in your tree, and essentially, I don't know how this is going to go forward, but let's say that mm -hmm. I want to use this version. Is it so heavily modified that it cannot function with the standard sockets? Uh, or, I mean, can you switch back and forth with the same Very binary? Good Very good question. So as as mentioned on uh, or as I tried to highlight at, at one point, we we now have support in Envoy for pluggable uh, socket interfaces. That means that you can even have multiple socket interfaces active at one time. So you can have, for instance, in Envoy now a kernel socket interface, which actually you always have it is the default one. And then you can have a VCL socket interface. You can then, based on Envoy specific mechanisms, in particular, for instance, addresses can, can request either default processing or an address could come with a hint that says, please, this address use it on, uh, on VCL socket. Um, and then Envoy make make sure to to open the, the right socket for you or through the right uh, socket interface. So short answer to your question, yes, we can switch. So you, uh, Envoy, you can bring Envoy up with the default kernel interface and then you can, you can load this additional module. Having said that, 
the code that sits in that branch that um, I mentioned is it's an extension, but not an official extension of, of Envoy. Reason why it's not an ex official extension is because Envoy builds a static binary. So Envoy would need to build part of VPP uh, in order to build that extension. Mm -hmm. And at this point, it's pretty, uh, Envoy already is building way too many things. Uh, so I have not tried to push this upstream. Now, uh, my in my conversations with Matt, uh, we, we sort of decided that if there's enough interest in, in having this upstream, we could upstream it and, and then make sure that everything is built together. And then you will have at runtime just some switches that you can uh, flip and then you can use either the kernel or, or VCL. Great, okay, thanks. Thank you. Would that be a um, deployment time configuration or can, Front time. can it be, do you think that could be dynamic where it says, what are your capabilities? And it wants to have, I guess, maybe VPP as a preferred. And if it doesn't, then it could fall back to others. Interesting. Uh, I think the answer could be that we could we could do the second option that you that you mentioned. So if you if you have the right means of detecting if VPP is is active, starting Envoy. Well, right now one of the options is to at Envoy startup just to say I would like to use as a default. Uh, the VCL socket interface as opposed to the kernel socket interface. I'm trying to remember, but I can't right now, if we can change at runtime the default socket interface. So uh, when I say default, I mean, if, if addresses are not injected uh, with the right attributes into Envoy, they will all default to using uh, the default socket interface. If you, for instance, configure Envoy with addresses, and by configure with addresses, I mean when you pass an address that goes through a resolver, if you configure that resolver to always default to, to assigning uh, VCL as an interface, you actually do not care. So basically, this will be. Um, a configuration that you can inject at runtime and say, oh, whenever you open the new connection to a backend, for instance, or, or something like that, make sure to use uh, the VCL interface, not, not the kernel interface. And you can do that explicitly. If you, just, if you are just worried about default behavior, then you can detect when VPP, if you can detect when, sorry, Envoy starts, you can just uh, configure it to to use um, use VCL as opposed to the kernel as a default. All right. Cool. Lauren, a question. I, I might, you may have answered this in one of Nikolai's questions, but the succinctly, like the availability of, uh, since VPP is user space, but mm -hmm. uh, from what I understood, it might require, its installation requires maybe a, another module, a kernel module or two that you wouldn't commonly find available in popular cloud providers' environments. Is that, is that a, an accurate? characterization of it kind of you, uh, you... as far as i know it works on any of the default kernels it's um more of the stack right below the app what it uses and you're going to get into the yeah, dptk so and then yep. the, you start looking at acceleration or something else um, but you don't have to use it by default that's exactly so. 
Tyler had a, a good description. So it all depends eventually on what um, uh, on the DPTK needs that you have underneath. Um, if you deploy if you deploy VPP with say um, with without DPDK, and now it will depend a lot on what sort of drivers you try to use, SRIOV, uh, AVF, or anything else, you will need just the dependencies for those, but normally it should work with, um, with all um, current, well, with all modern kernels, let's at least stipulate that. Um, if you're thinking about kernel modules that might be needed and are not typically uh, provided, I'm guessing you're thinking about something like uh, VFIO, PCI, or, or, or stuff like that. Those are typically needed for DPDK. Okay, gotcha. I've seen more problems on the, the physical host side, like are certain things turned on in the BIOS more than it does the kernel work? And then you get into stuff on like privilege mode. If you're doing, how are you going to access, if you use say MIF devices to talk between um, containers mm -hmm. or pods, then having access to the device files has to happen. So you have to figure out something there. Gotcha. Okay. Yes. So. Mm -hmm. Uh, so yeah, I guess yeah. So given those um, given those requirements, is it um, is there a specific uh, well, if you take e EC two for example, is there a specific EC two type that um, and OS? I guess that sort of well, and I guess this is also one of those. It depends on what functions you're going to use, but yeah, maybe it's just. Sure. Fair enough. And sorry for interrupting. We know, so VPP can be deployed in EC2 and has been deployed, but as you said, for specific, with specific functions, I've never tried doing this, for instance, with Envoy. We've done it with IPsec, for instance, uh, just to see how, how fast the implementation would be. And with DPDK, it seems to be working fine. Nice, okay. Yeah, I recall, yeah, it's been some time, but I recall trying to assist in the CSR, well, I think it was the CSR 1000V and Nexus 1000V kind of going after mm -hmm. uh, secure tunneling use cases between, okay. Yeah. Oh. Very, good, very good point. Uh, separate effort, but um, uh, as far as uh, as far as we can tell, and I, when I say we, I mean the community, the open, and I'm not talking in the name of my employer, but the community, we, we've managed to get this to to work in that, those sort of, those type of scenarios, and performance seems to be pretty good, um, maybe better than the other that you've mentioned. Um. Another another quick question. It might have that I heard this out of context, or I didn't hear the right. Is um, there was part of your discussion was about was about um, an envoy per node, and mm -hmm. and some caveats around that. And and I didn't quite catch the the use case or the need for uh, for that architectural model. Very good question, actually. So. Um... The problem that I've heard, not that I've hit any time in, in practice, was um, that Envoy communication to the upper layers, say to Istio, uh, becomes the bottleneck when you have too many Envoy instances uh, deployed. So for instance, you, you, you end up into uh, large or moderate deployments end up needing hundreds of megabits to gigabits per second of control traffic when in case of a restart event, massive restart event, let's say. Um, so the idea was the, 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 the solution to, to that problem was to, well, let's have one of them per node and have that be multi-tenant. 
as opposed to having multiple small instances of, of envoys that we uh, load at sidecars. Um, I think Cilium have been working on that. I don't know exactly how far they've, they've gotten with it. Makes, thanks for that, that makes a lot of sense. Uh, uh, questions from others for Florin. Lauren, this, this has been nice. This is uh, it's a special treat, I think, for some of us. We, uh, uh, I th we, we kind of switched between uh, doing project reviews to uh, meandering between a bunch of topics to receiving presentations like this. And um, I have to say that the, the nerd in me uh, appreciates a good uh, set of uh, diagrams. So, so um, thank, thank you very you. much. Yeah. Thank you very much, Lee, for, for the invitation. It's, it's been my pleasure, and hopefully it's been useful for you as well. Yes, it really has. And actually, um, Ed, uh, thank you so much for this connection, this uh, uh, pointing well, out. I, I appreciate all of you asking. Um, it was, you know, I was delighted to set it up. Uh, always happy to, to hear Florin speak. And, you know, it was, it was good that this came up in the course of conversation. I am going to, well, I'm fumbling with Zoom. This doesn't happen that often, but uh, yeah, there we go. I think I, I think I had to uh, press the button. So <laughs> you have control. <laughs> Good. Well, we're not using WebEx, otherwise I talk about the ball, the proverbial ball. Oh, very good. Uh, so, so next, um, Next couple of topics up. Um, I think the, the next couple are relatively quick. Um, it's more about probably awareness. So uh, for some of you who've been on these, the last, the, the more recent calls, we've um, used this time to um, opportunistically discuss uh, some of the work streams that are taking place inside the Service Mesh Working Group. So the Service Mesh Working Group, just a, uh, a, a subgroup of uh, sort of the a subgroup focused on service meshes, um, whereas SIG Network itself has a much um, broader field of field of view. Um, it's worth noting that uh, we had been hosting those discussions, kind of those set those sessions at this time, kind of using um, this time to advance some of those initiatives. A couple of the initiatives within there are people are requesting more time uh, to discuss and advance um, SMI conformance is one. Uh, and the other one is SMP. So we'll briefly, um, a number of you are familiar with SMI conformance. Um, some of you are SMI maintainers. Uh, this initiative is, well, um, actually since, since Taylor is on, um, I'll use a common analogy that, that um, is used for CNF conformance, and it's to say that um, SMI is a specification. There are, I think, um, seven service meshes that um, signal compatibility with the spec. That's great. Um, the last couple of major service mesh announcements of new meshes coming into the ecosystem were SMI compliant, actually the last three four maybe. Um, and so uh, as there is a sonoboy to um, Kubernetes, to the 90 something distributions of Kubernetes, there's kind of a, there's a, um, um, a, a an SMI conformance, a, a meshery to SMI to help validate conformance to that specification. And so there's um, uh, there's a, a recurring meeting to be scheduled to help advance that initiative. Uh, if we are organized about this, we'll send out a, a poll to ask what's a convenient meeting time. Um, if we're not organized about it, you'll see it on your calendar. <laughs> um, the second, so any comment on SMI conformance before we move to
Um, this other one um, is uh, touches up against uh, some of what Florin was speaking about with respect to the some of the value that use of VPP provides. Uh, some of that was around performance. There's uh, an emergent specification called uh, service mesh performance um, or SMP. Um, within context of the discussions around SMP, um, this week uh, we were meeting with um, Envoy's load generator uh, called Nighthawk, meeting with uh, their maintainers and discussing a number of things. But one of those things is in some respects to what Florin had said earlier about different, so Envoy has different distributions and there's a project that assists with that. That project is called Get Envoy. Um, as uh, service meshes gain in popularity and as um, performance is a question on a lot of people's minds or is a continued question just as and when people use service meshes. Uh, there's been a, a project proposal um, tentatively named Get Nighthawk to help um, with uh, create distributions of Nighthawk because um, today that's available uh, in a Docker container. And so there's a substream kind of uh, in, inside of the uh, SMP discussions that's to be scheduled. So any comments on SMP or Nighthawk? Good deal. And so we've got about 15 more minutes left, um, a couple of topics. Um, uh, Taylor, is it, given that there's 15 minutes, I don't know if it'll, how long these each one will take, but I thought I'd ask if one of the two of these that you would like to prioritize for discussion first versus the next, or consider that they're kind of hand in hand? Uh, well, um, uh, they're related, but they are, I guess, independent uh, pieces. So I, I could probably do the first real quick and then move on to the next, which is maybe more important. Uh, could I share my screen? All right. So the cloud native principles, um, it's trying to, um, these papers, which are here in this GitHub repo, it's a whole set of, of papers talking, trying to break down the different concepts that are all tied into um, what you have right here. So just when we go and look at what CNCF has, in this uh, minimal set of information. Part of it um, talks about what it's going to do, like benefits and how this you know, works as far as groups. There's actually not a lot that really talks about what do these mean. And so this has been an ongoing work for quite a while and Maybe the newest thing, and I, I don't know if, if you've seen this specifically, Lee, but from getting feedback, talking to um, different people in the TOC and other places, we had created the fundamental concepts area. So this is would tie into what you see on these definitions. And most of these would be agreed by most people, trying to keep it more generic and not Kubernetes specific, but the this is to lead up to these other set of papers. So starting out with a cloud, uh, breaking down what do we mean by cloud native and going into each of the concepts. I think I just clicked on the wrong one. This one was the one I meant. These actually start breaking down all of this individual concepts and you'll have an area here that's more English and then it's um, talking about how it ties together with references. So that's the big thing. This isn't just coming from um, the people that have been involved, uh, people that are creating software, uh, telco service providers was a lot of the focus on here and networking folks. But these references are a lot of different people um, doing things in DevOps, 
uh, networking in general and cloud native. And the whole set of papers is building through to eventually what it gets to this area. So what do we mean when we say cloud native networking? And going down and trying to answer different questions. And then it actually breaks those down into further pieces. So you have stuff talking about what do we mean by microservices, immutable infrastructure, and then getting into the OSI. Um, how, do, how does it relate to the OSI stack? And that's really the main thing here. These set of papers, it's also available as a good book. They are leveraged by several different communities and there's been a lot of you know, collaboration from people on them. And uh, CNTT, I don't know if anyone's familiar with that, the LFN community, they, they point to some of these, but it's at this point, it's something where there's a lot more people within, I'd say uh, CNCF in general that are wanting to have more of this well-defined. And so that's the effort. So we'd be happy to get more eyes on that. How much time do we have? Nine minutes? The, uh, so to, to hmm, yeah, this is, right. um, I guess a quick, quick, well, quick point of clarification that, um, so I think the discussion that we've had in this SIG a few times has been about uh, the cloud native networking principles and, but the, the, over, the overarching initiative um, is, well, is to define is to further refine cloud native, which um, I have to say, you you guys are you guys are sick puppies for trying to take this on because, uh, like, what a well one there's sort of some natural contention with trying to just define all all the components of what you know all the characteristics of what makes something cloud native and and expanding on that. There's been a similar initiative that was uh, proposed by an, an architect at, at Microsoft. Um, and it was to start with um, a bunch of, it was on patterns and it was to start with service mesh patterns. Um, but, but his vision was to define much of that pattern, like cloud native patterns for all of the things of which uh, it was hard to fathom that um, landing or, be, or like um, ever congealing. But so of the, just to clarify then, I guess the question is the, um, cloud native networking principles, those are the deepest set of papers thus far. Is, is that accurate or are there, are there some lengthy papers on what it means to be a microservice or to be loosely coupled or to, to things? That are... I don't think there's been anything that pulls it all together that's as extensive as these sets right here. And really what we're saying is these four. So this one is a build up but it, it has, you can see a ton of references. These all go into lots of lots of different books and people that have been doing this. They don't all say cloud native, but you know, this managing servers in the cloud, you know, but that goes all over. I don't know of anything that's as extensive as, as these sets. So it's kind of an aggregation of all this. Yeah, it's it's been, um, I'd say, brutal to say we're taking on trying to say where does what look at all of the layers but what we found specifically um and which on the the next is the cnf conformance when we're looking into telco and how to try to help bring some of these things where the philosophies from like devops where cicd is just a norm on for enterprise and everything else um and try to bring a lot of the philosophies and methodologies that are already commonplace, you have to go further back. It, it just doesn't work unless you have those concepts well-defined. And um, I, I think that's why you'll see like, here's a vendor meta switch, which I can, I can drop this in there. And they just came out with something in November and these papers we had done um, more than a year before that, but it's it's taken this long for vendors to actually start talking about 
why virtualization doesn't work and you have to rethink things in a different way. And if you're coming from the enterprise, it's another side where you're just like, I already, I already agree, it's a given. Um, but they go in and talk about having a re-architect. You can't go in and just utilize your, your application as is, move it over into containers. Um, and that's really what this is about. Like, how can you say that without breaking down what the underlying principles actually mean and how they're applied and how they're going to affect you? Got it. Got it. I'm happy to chat more if people want on that. I would like to at least just mention the um, CNF conformance program and uh, you can check out the presentation that happened this week to the TFC. And it was primarily about a new working group, but that I'm gonna actually go over into, it's probably easier. So there's a, new working group that's being formed and there will be a first kickoff meeting at well this taken a while at kubecon um it's on the schedule but the idea with this conformance program is to have something similar to what the kubernetes conformance is and um the way the kubernetes conformance program breaks down underneath is you have uh, the conformance working group, SIG architecture, SIG testing, and they're all handling different aspects. Within the CNF conformance program, we have um, the CNF conformance test suite project. So that would be equivalent to what SIG testing is doing. But as I think Lee, you might have mentioned, said something about this with Sonaboy earlier. Um, we've actually, this, this project has created the test suite to look a little bit more like Sonaboy as far as like configuration and other stuff. But it, then it actually has tests within it that are actually um, there. Versus Sonaboy has a plugin to run the external test, which you could have run directly using the framework um, in the, Kubernetes CD, but so that's where the, the mechanics and the actual tests are implemented. It, right now it all shares one repository, but this new working group will be defining uh, what, what it means to be a, I'm gonna bring up the charter. So what it means to, probably the biggest one is what it means to be conformant uh, with regards to cloud native best practices for CNFs. And, you know, one of the things that we were pointing out is data plane CNFs. So I think the stuff that we were talking about today with VPP and Envoy and stuff is very important for these. When you look at um, a CNF or an application providing network functionality that's at a non data plane layer, it's it may be a lot easier to talk about its behavior and best practices because it's going to look more equivalent to stuff that's already in agreement or SIG app delivery is already saying, here's some best practices. But when you get down to data plane, CNFs and other ones, maybe operators and stuff that are tied in, it starts to get a little bit different on what does that look like on best practices. So this working group is going to be focused on that as far as the initial scope and the process, like what is the process, just like Kubernetes, you walk through a certain stage, you run Sonaboy, you have pull requests, there's a bunch of things. So it'll do all that decisions. Um, and then, as I said, the test suite project will be separate. Please join the KubeCon if you have time and the future ones definitely want people that are no networking and application development. And we're trying to get them working with in the cloud native side and then working with the service providers, the telco people. I know we're at time, but I can answer any questions if 
Beautiful. Taylor, did you was there any further feedback from the TOC from the from Tuesday's presentation? Um not much. I mean it's mainly that they're trying to get more people engaged on it. And they know that, you know, I went to SIGAP delivery yesterday and here today because there's a overlap on the way these things work. But um I think we'll see more by KubeCon and we'll continue. Okay. Yeah, my understanding is like so so we used to host the uh Oh, uh, the, CN, the CNCF networking working group, sort of before SIGs became a thing. Um, and the networking working group sort of um, rolled into SIG network or became SIG network. Um, I think the, the structure um, as it is now with, with SIGs is that um, they may end up spawning any, um, any number of um, working groups within the SIGs. And so it, so I guess in part what I'm trying to say is that um, I think SIGs, the life cycle of a SIG sort of operates I think in context, I'm sorry, the life cycle of a working group operates in context of a SIG. Um, and so, yeah, getting a, a landing spot in a SIG makes, makes a lot of sense as kind of a, a home base. There's um, an example of a, we were just talking about the service mesh working group, but another one within CNCF SIG network is the UDP, UDP, the Universal Data Plane API Working Group, or UDPA, um, which is an Envoy, the Envoy API, more or, or formed around the Envoy API. Um, the uh, any feedback from SIG app delivery from your presentation yesterday? Um, I mean, they're they're all interested. They have a there's a, a Air Gap Working Group that's the one telco focused working group that was in SIG app delivery because most of it's non non networking telco type apps and that one SIG app, uh, sorry air gap is is a more of an edge type of focus so it doesn't match up to it doesn't cover most of the stuff that we're talking about specifically on like core the core network um, type of network functions. Those type of things are going to look different from what AirGap covered. But there's interest and there's at least, if, I, I think from the standpoint of best practices and stuff, there's going to be a buildup on multiple areas. Like there's going to be things in SIG network that we want to have covered and included in their stuff from SIG app delivery. But right now it's just listed as um, different groups. I mean, that we think this is just a subset, but ones where we think there's going to be collaboration. Okay, it's a cloud native network, CNF cloud native network uh, function. Yes. Okay. Cloud native network function. Okay. Versus, we're not saying containerized network function. And there is a lot of different thoughts on what network function, whether it's um, a name that's just a marketing term, or if you're going to take it and break it down to what the intent of those words are. Which is why part of the scope is making sure that it's communicated also with the working group. What we're saying but right now you could i would say think of it as um and this is from some of the even the service telco service providers is a, a telco or networking application so um, yeah, but it's, yeah. and those that are participating right now are telco centric T telco and kind of network as the first in scope kind of data plane uh data plane conformance yeah, so for as far as conformance goes, then it's trying to provide something for the, right now it's for the telco space. I mean, there's some of the service providers have said, telco is a subset of the networking domain. So then it becomes broader um, as far as that goes. But the, the idea right now is to help 
telcos and actually becoming more cloud native. And, and right now it's saying, let's focus on the applications that are deployed on their Kubernetes um, based platforms or distros, whatever you want to say. Um, thank you for this, Taylor. This is, this is good. Um, uh, if, you know, please follow up with Taylor if you have uh, questions about this. I, I recognize we're five after, so, um, so we'll, we'll, we'll end it here for today, but uh, thank you, Florin. Thank you, Taylor. It was a full agenda. Um, same, same time in a couple of weeks. Cool. Thanks for having me. Here. Right. Bye all. Thank you. Thanks, bye.